Hey everybody, this is Nolan Hedstrom, podcast and broadcast personality for 4playernetwork.com, and these are my top 10 games of 2012. Starting off with number 10 is Dishonored. This is the stealth game that I wanted this year. Uh, the stealth first person game. I mean, like Hitman did not give me what I wanted in a game this year, and this is a better Hitman game than Hitman was. It was just a phenomenal game. Um, I loved that it gave you different paths, different options to do. You could, you know, sneak in the side door or through a, a grate. Or you can just walk up to the front and start stabbing people in the face because it's just so open. All the different abilities they give you, the ability you can blink, you know, teleport from one place to another. It's just a fantastic array of things. You know, take over someone's body, stop time, freeze time. It's just so many different things that made this game fun and exciting and nerve-wracking. Because when you're playing stealthily and you get caught... Panic sets in, but instead of restarting a level or something, I could just keep going because of the abilities and the way they give you to just move around the environment is just fantastic. The story was even engaging to me. I had a lot of fun just exploring the world, reading some of the lore in the books, and just finding out where it went. This was a great game, and that's why it made my number 10. Number 9 on my list goes to Journey. The, this game is great because there is no intro, there's no tutorial, there's no nothing. It just drops you in a world, and it doesn't even say go. It just drops you in. And for a few seconds I was staring at the screen like, oh, I'm playing right now. The lighting in this game is amazing. The lighting, the sound effects, the environment, it just all brings you into the game. And it's so not linear that you can start running in the wrong direction and not even know it at first. It gives you some hints and stuff, but it's so open. There's so much you can explore in this world that has no HUD. It has nothing. It doesn't tell you anything. There are a few temples you can go to that have pictures that tell a story, but there's no words. There's no audio. It's just fantastic. It's so beautiful. Eventually, you end up meeting another person, and they start traveling the world with you, but you can't communicate besides making little blips and kind of, you know, trying to get, get run over here. You know, you try and get them to come with you, and then eventually you realize, oh, I'm, I'm playing with another person. This isn't an NPC. This isn't a computer. This is someone else in the world at the same part of the game as me, and you're playing together now. And it just... The adventure you go on together without ever even meeting each other or knowing who they were and just you know you travel up some mountain on this great adventure and it just it feels good this this was a great game and I hope more games artistic games like this come out in the future coming in at number eight on my list is Far Cry 3 this game had so many improvements over the second game it was just phenomenal not just looks but the actual gameplay itself like if you were to overtake an outpost and now it's your outpost you know your guys guard that area instead of the second game when they would just repopulate the enemies would repopulate and you'd have to fight them again but now they're gone and so you can take over an outpost and then you can buy new weapons and with your new weapons you can upgrade them you can increase the magazine size and add scopes and make them different colors it was really good and this game scratched this itch that I have for loot, loot, loot. I love collecting loot. I love collecting items. I love when I have a mini-map and there's an item on it and I can see it so I have to run off and collect it. And oh, um, if I get some shark skin, I can increase this pouch. So oh, well now I gotta go find some sharks and I gotta hunt them and hunting sharks is so terrifying because you're swimming in the water and a shark can come out of nowhere and just kill you dead. And it's just exciting. This world was a lot of fun to traverse, you know, different vehicles, there's jeeps, there's, you know, hang gliders, there's a wingsuit you can get to fly around, and it, was, it felt really good, 
and it was a lot of fun. The story wasn't the best in my opinion, and I really did not like Jason Brody, the main character. I felt he should have been a silent protagonist. He kind of got on my nerves a little bit. But other than that, this is a fantastic first-person shooter, and I loved it. Marking the number 7 spot on my list is Mark of the Ninja. This was a great stealth side-scrolling game, and just a great stealth game in general. The way they handle shadow and light is really well done. When you go into the shadows, the screen kind of darkens, and if you walk into a light, everything brightens up, and guards can see you in the light, so you have to stick to the shadows. There's an emphasis on a lack of combat. You don't necessarily want to walk up to somebody and just start fighting them because they'll shoot you. Depending on the outfit you're wearing, you only have a sword and a couple of items, or maybe even not a sword. So you really want to stick to the shadows and let people come to you and take them out quietly. And if you do end up getting caught, this game reloads very quickly, so you don't have to wait for loading screens. You just press load, and you can just start again from your last checkpoint. Depending on the tasks you do, you can find scrolls and do these little things, and you get more points for the level, which you then use to upgrade your equipment so you can make an item quieter or carry more of it. And it just it's a really good system for upgrading your tools. And so you get points for killing people or finishing objectives, but you can also get points for avoiding combat. You know, for all those people you leave alive, you get points, and so it, you, know, you really do have two different paths you can take. The story in this game was also really well done. At the end, you have a choice between two options, and no matter which one you choose, it, it doesn't tell you what's right or wrong, it's just that's the choice you made and you live with your decisions. I did actually play through the game a second time on New Game Plus, and it is a little more difficult, but I think it also stands up to the, you know, the test of time. I might even play this game a third time, because it was a really good game, well done. Number six on my list is Dust and Elysian Tale. This is a Metroidvania-esque RPG uh, that was indie developed, and they did a fantastic job with this game. Uh, you know, you go to towns and you get quests, and you go off and you on these quests, and they take you to different areas. You know, there's dungeons underground and these sky areas that are all really well designed. You know, certain in Metroidvania in the sense that you can't get to certain areas, but then you learn new abilities that will let you, you know, overcome like you know, breakable walls or slide under something. It's really well done. Every line of dialogue in this game is voiced, and it's voiced quite well. Uh, I enjoyed listening to the characters and meeting new people. It's kind of quirky, all the creatures are furries, you know, they're all animals. And you travel around with a talking sword and a flying fox creature that's afraid of heights. But I really enjoyed collecting the loot, and then you find blueprints and you can craft new weapons and armors and stuff like that that increase your abilities and as the game goes on you really feel like you're more powerful. Enemies don't scale with you so at the beginning of the game you'll be having difficult times with enemies but then later on when you backtrack you know it's a lot easier to get past them. The story's pretty interesting. I didn't really like the ending that much but other than that I had a lot of fun and this is a great RPG. Starting off the top 5 of my list is XCOM Enemy Unknown. This is one of the best strategy games I've played in a while because it incorporates a lot of elements that just add to the overall experience. You have the main part, which is the turn-based strategy, combating aliens with your troops, and then you have your home base of XCOM, where you have to manage money and resources and helping other countries who are requesting help. There's just a lot that goes into it. If you start with your base, you have to manage your money, so you have a certain amount of money you get each month, and you have to decide, am I going to use this to research new technologies, to buy new equipment for my troops, to send up a new satellite so I can help out other countries, and at that same time, you have countries sending requests to you at the same time. Maybe three different countries are all requesting help, and you have to determine which one needs my help more than the other ones. And then once you go into combat, your troops level up, and since I played on Iron Man mode, I had permadeath and there was only one save, so if I made a mistake in battle, there was a lot of weight to that mistake. All my choices felt like they were important choices. And so I had to determine, oh, well, I can't just bring all my majors or all my generals. I have to bring some rookies with me so they can learn, but I can't just bring all lo rookies or they're all going to end up dying. And that just adds so much to the difficulty of the game. It's a good difficulty, though. The game is constantly challenging you in a good way, and you can want to keep playing more. And I'll tell myself, I'll play, oh, just one more mission. You know, I'll just get one more satellite up, and then all of a sudden it'll be four hours later, and it's 3 a.m. Space. The final frontier. These are the voyages of Nolan's top ten list. Number four. FTL Faster Than Light may not seem like much at first. It's a fairly simple looking game, not 
big on the graphics department, but it has so much more underneath. You're a spaceship trying to get to an allied fleet, you know, light years off in the distance to get some information to them, all while you're being chased by a rebel army. And so, you, you start off with a very simple ship, minimal guns, but then as you get farther you attain new crew members of different races and new weapons that you can use to take out your enemies. Space itself in this game is a big deal because you encounter asteroid fields that will pelt your ship with asteroids and solar flares that can start fires on the deck of your ship and nebulas where you know some of your sensors are down and stuff like that. The subsystems in this game go so deep in the sense that you know a fire starts on your deck and it's, you can have someone go in there and put it out with an extinguisher or if they're busy you can just open up some of the doors and vent the fire out in the space and now the problem is the oxygen goes with it and so if someone is in that area they then have no oxygen oxygen to breathe and they'll die. And you can use that as well against your enemies. You can send crew members over and you can disable their oxygen system there, or you can do one-on-one -on -one combat with them and that way you get more resources when you defeat them. There's just so much in this game and there's so many different ways you can play it that there's so much replayability to it. A game can last anywhere from 10 minutes to 45 minutes. It's just so amazing how much this game has to offer. And all for just a little price, it's well worth it. Splunky is number three on my list because I have been defeated by this game 754 times. Let that sink in. 754, and I keep coming back for more. I've only actually been to the final boss of this game six times. And to top it off, turns out there's actually a more difficult boss that's hidden than that one that's defeated me the six times I've been there. But I guess I'm just a glutton for the punishment this game doles out. It starts fairly simple, you're an explorer, you have a whip and some rope and some bombs, but then eventually you're able to find shotguns and boomerangs and machetes and freeze rays, and you start off with simple enemies like bats and snakes, and eventually you start fighting piranhas and woolly mammoths that shoot ice beams, and mummies that spray out locusts from their mouths, and the god Anubis who has a scepter that shoots powers at you. And you start off with only four health, but you can get more by rescuing damsels, or you can choose to sacrifice that damsel to the god Kali, who will then shower you with gifts, unless you blow up Kali's altar, who will then shower you with spiders. It's so easy to be doing so well in this game, and then all of a sudden just die from spikes or a rolling ball. Each area in the game, there's four main areas, there's a cave, a jungle, an ice area, and a temple, and some secret areas as well. And each area is kept pretty short, the levels there are short, because if you stay on a level too long, a ghost will come and instantly kill you if it touches you. And to top it all off, there's also a local multiplayer, which up to four people can play, that's pretty quirky. Wow, wow. The number two game in my heart this year is The Walking Dead Season 1. A lot of people will refer to this game as The Walking Feels because of the emotions it brings up in you, and that's no joke. This game has a lot of heavy emotions to it. Some people will describe it as more of an interactive game or an interactive movie even, and while that may be the case that it's a little more interactive than gameplay, it still deserves all the praise it is getting. I don't think I have ever been more attached to characters in a game than I was in this game. The decisions and that you have to make really do weigh a heavy down on you. You can actually watch me play the entirety of the game on our Twitch channel and see the emotions that get brought up in me, from anger to fear to joy to just shock and awe. Telltale took a lot of risks when they made this game and put it out there, and it succeeded on every level in my opinion. The replayability of this game isn't the highest because you kind of know what's going to end up happening. And the decisions that you actually make seem like they're going to have a big impact on the game, even though they don't, but they have a big impact on yourself. At one point a character in the game saw me doing something I would have never done knowing someone was watching, which really surprised me at how much I cared about what this other, you know, imaginary person thought about me. And I felt so much responsibility for some of the characters, you have a, a pretty big role in the game, and it just really does make you feel like you are there in that world and what you do is important. The decisions you are making are important. And this is one of those rare games that both hardcore gamers and casual gamers could get a great experience out of. And last but not least, because in my opinion it's the best, is my number one game, Dragon's Dogma. This is an action RPG put out by Capcom 
that stands leaps and bounds above all the other games that came out this year. Instead of having co-op, you have pawns in this game. You create a pawn, and they're your pawn, and they travel around with you, and they learn as you go, and you can invite other people's pawns into your game. So when they come into your game, they bring all the knowledge that they learned from the other games into yours, and when your pawn gets taken to someone else's game, they will also come back with experience they learned from that game, which can be very helpful if you're fighting an enemy that you've never encountered before. Your pawn might be like, oh, I know their kind is weak to fire, which will let you know to use fire instead of ice. And also, the class system in this game are known as vocations, and you start off very simple. You can be one of three choices, and then as you go on, you can expand. So you can be an archer or a warrior, but then you can become a mystic knight, which can use magic and swords. You can become a mystic archer, which shoots magical arrows, or an assassin, which does better when they're on their own, and they can even become invincible with a certain ability. The best part about this system is, is when you train under one class, you gain passive abilities, which you can actually combine with other classes. So once you learn all of the different abilities, you can pick and choose which ones you like the best to make an ultimate character. Combat is also done really well in this game, in the sense that it's physical and you can climb on creatures like you can climb on a chimera or climb up a cyclops' back and stab him in the eye, and then he'll no longer be able to see and will just start swinging around randomly. If a dragon is attacking you from the air, you can shoot at its wings, which will cause it to fall down to the ground, where you then have the upper hand against it. And even though the story in this game isn't the easiest to follow, the combat and the vocation systems, along with the completely open world, make it my go-to game for this year, and probably for years to come. Well, I hope you enjoyed my top 10 games of 2012, and if I convinced at least one of y'all to pick up a game you hadn't thought about before, I know I'm doing a good job. Also, be sure to follow me on Twitter at TheInfamousNolan, and stay tuned to 4PlayerNetwork.com. We have some great things planned for 2013.